Every time that we post a video about drones, radios, satellites, autonomous weapons, or anything, really, there's always people in the comments saying things like, it doesn't matter, an EMP is going to take it all out anyways, so let's talk about it. Yes, electromagnetic pulses are real. High altitude nuclear detonations, microwave weapons, and even solar flares can absolutely mess with electronics. This is not a conspiracy theory. But EMPs are not magic wands. They're not the easy button for victory. And for all the fear around them, the real story of EMPs is more complicated and less dramatic than you've probably been led to believe. Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm Kyle, and today we're going to walk through what EMPs can actually do, how vulnerable the military really is, and why these weapons aren't the apocalypse that some people think they are. Before we get started, we want to thank Odoo for sponsoring today's episode. If you're still managing your business with a mess of spreadsheets, sticky notes, and a patchwork of apps, stop the chaos. Odoo brings it all under one roof with a unified business management system that covers everything from sales to shipping to the shop floor. Odoo gives you full control over inventory and manufacturing from a single dashboard. You can track receipts, deliveries, point of sales orders, and work orders in real time. You'll see exactly what's moving, what's delayed, and what needs attention. You can automate vendor reminders, schedule shipments, scan components with a mobile barcode code app and update worksheets or bills of material on the fly. Whether you're running one warehouse or 10, Odoo keeps your operation fast, accurate, and fully connected. The best part though, everything talks to everything. Sales, e-commerce, CRM, inventory, manufacturing. It's one connected system, not a Frankenstein of bolt-on. So if you're done taping your business together with whatever software you can find, head over to odoo.com. Your first app is free. No trial, no credit card, no nonsense. You've got a business to run, let Odoo make it easier. First, let's get the basics out of the way. There are three main types of EMP. First, the big one, and the one that most people are probably thinking about when they think about an EMP, and that's an HEMP, or if you wanna get fun with it, you can say hemp. That stands for High Altitude Electromagnetic Pulse. This is what most people are thinking of when they say EMP weapon. A nuclear bomb detonated at high altitude between 30 and 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface can create a wide area electromagnetic pulse. For the record, a nuclear explosion near the ground also releases an EMP, but it's usually weaker because of terrain and the atmosphere, but it's still a nuclear bomb, so it's pretty destructive anyway. The EMP from a nuke blown up in space is made up of all three phases, and that's E1, E2, and E3. Just like their enlisted equivalents, you'll see that they match their energy quite a bit. E1 is the fast, intense spike that fries unshielded microelectronics. Think processors, circuit boards, avionics. It's like a brand new boot private that still hasn't given up and thinks they can change the system, so they come in just guns blazing, charging away with a ton of energy. E1 fries electronics by inducing a powerful voltage spike over an extremely short time scale on the order of nanoseconds. That sudden energy surge overwhelms the delicate pathways in semiconductors, integrated circuits, and other tightly packed electronics, especially those designed for low power consumption. The smaller and more efficient the device is, the more vulnerable it tends to be to E1 pulses. E2 is slower and similar more to a lightning strike or an actual E2 who doesn't quite care as much, is starting to think everyone in charge of them is stupid, but hasn't given up entirely. Most systems with surge protection can shrug this off, but unprotected long line conductors, poorly grounded antennas, and some communications relays, especially those connected to power lines or large metallic structures, can still suffer damage. In older or improvised military systems, these components can be especially vulnerable if surge arresters aren't installed or maintained properly. And then there's E3, and that's the long duration pulse caused by the distortion of Earth's magnetic field. Like an enlisted E3, it seems to realize that time 
time is undefeated and even the strongest of wills can be broken with persistent belligerence. It can induce currents that fry transformers and high voltage power lines, especially across the civilian grid. So that's the hemp and all the phases, and then there's NNEMP, and that's non-nuclear EMP, which is usually referring to directed energy weapons like high-powered microwaves or RF bombs. These have a much smaller range, but they can be much more precise. Unlike nuclear EMPs, NNEMP effects are typically dominated by the E1 type pulse. That's the strong, fast, and capable of damaging small, unshielded electronics at close range. Because they don't involve nuclear reactions, NNEMP systems produce little to no E2 or E3 phase. A good example of something like this is the US military's CHAMP program, which is short for Counter Electronics High Power Microwave Advanced Missile Project. It's a cruise missile that disables electronics without blowing anything up. The Air Force has also tested microwave weapons as part of its Tactical High Power Operational Responder, or THOR system, and the Marine Corps has fielded smaller directed energy systems to counter drones on actual real-world deployments. They're training exercises, but you get the idea. These are all considered forms of non-nuclear EMPs because they're short, localized bursts that disable electronics using intense microwave radiation. And the third EMP threat comes from solar flares. More specifically, they're coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, and they're from the sun that create EMP-like effects, but on a global scale. These events primarily mimic the E3 phase of a nuclear EMP. It's a slow, geomagnetically induced current that can damage long electrical conductors and transformers across the power grid. The most famous example of a CME is the Carrington event of 1859, which set telegraph lines on fire. A modern day version, if it ever happened, and it's more when instead of if, could disable satellites and portions of the power grid without any missile ever being launched. Solar flares regularly happen, but they don't often impact Earth, at least not directly and on a mass scale. Though in 2022, a geomagnetic storm from a solar flare took out 40 Starlink satellites. Now that we know a little bit about EMPs and they don't seem so, so bad and not like this magic force that will just come in the flip of a switch and kill us all, we have to wonder why everybody still seems to be so scared of them. There is, of course, science fiction to blame and video games, and you can't forget about Danny Ocean and his wily band of confidence men and thieves. But outside of that, the fear is actually grounded in reality. In 1962, the US ran a nuclear test that they called Starfish Prime, which is a pretty great thing to name a nuclear test, which was a 1.4 megaton bomb detonated 250 miles above the Pacific Ocean. At the time, the US was exploring whether high altitude nuclear detonations could serve as a kind of ballistic missile defense or communications disruption tool. It was part of Operation Fishbowl, which was a Cold War era test series intended to study the effects of nuclear explosions in near space. We had an idea of what would happen when we exploded a nuke in space, but nobody really knew for sure how this would go, so we exploded a nuke in space to leave no doubt. The result? It knocked out roughly 300 streetlights about 900 miles away in Hawaii, it also set off burglar alarms, and it damaged satellites. Specifically, it crippled, over time, six satellites, including Telstar 1, Ariel 1, Transit 4B, Engine 1, TRS-5B, and the Soviet satellite Cosmos 5. The radiation created by the blast formed artificial radiation belts that lingered for months, frying circuits and degrading solar panels. The big brains running the operation did not anticipate how large the EMP would be or that it would damage satellites like it did. While it didn't bring down the entire power grid and thrust us into a dystopian hellscape, it was enough to scare both US and Soviet military planners. From that point on, both sides began quietly hardening their nuclear command and control systems against EMPs. This method of nuclear defense, blowing up nukes in the atmosphere to create essentially a constant EMP, just wasn't practical for way more reasons that it destroyed things, so we decided to move on to more practical methods of protecting ourselves from nukes, 
like building more of them. The Starfish Prime Test also helped spur the 1963 Partial Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere, outer space, and underwater, largely because of concerns over radioactive fallout and the unintended consequences of high-altitude tests. Let's say, just for fun, we get an HEMP detonated above our heads. How bad could it really be? Most civilian infrastructure is unshielded. We're talking about aging transformers, digital SCADA systems, and networks that rely heavily on timing signals from GPS. GPS isn't just for navigation. It's what keeps the entire grid and most communication systems in sync. Lose that timing signal via the atomic clocks on the satellites and the whole thing just unravels. Anybody who works in networking or computer systems will tell you how important timing is. To put it in, and I apologize, very dry in academic terms, it is really important. Without it, much of our daily life would come crashing down. Military systems are a mixed bag, though. Strategic nuclear forces are hardened. Things like critical satellites, ICBMs, and deep underground bunkers were built to survive EMPs from nuclear war. Nuclear bombers like the B-2 and B-52, which will just never die, are hardened against EMP as part of the U.S. nuclear triad. These platforms typically have shielding and backup systems designed to allow them to survive and operate in a nuclear contaminated or post-EMP environment. Outside of that, though, it doesn't look too great for the old U.S. military. Not all military satellites are hardened against EMPs, and losing them could impact comms and a lot more. Even losing a few could degrade networks to the point where they're just essentially useless. Most military vehicles aren't EMP hardened either, and neither are radios, GPS receivers, and engine control units are all vulnerable as well. AM General even pitched the low-tech Humvee as an EMP-resistant vehicle back in 2017. It doesn't use many fancy electronics. The steering is hydraulic, the dash is analog, and there just isn't much in the way of microchips on them. So if an EMP hits, go find yourself a Humvee. Just don't forget to grab the keys. Most tactical aircraft aren't protected either. Rotary wing platforms like the UH-60 Blackhawk or fixed wing aircraft like the F-16, you know, there's some gray area with this, but they all rely heavily on digital avionics and all those nice, tiny, fancy microchips that we love. Everything. They power everything. But if they knock out fly-by-wire or GPS, all this fancy stuff that we love and put in everything means we're grounded. Drones and loitering munitions are even more fragile. They rely on uninterrupted communications and onboard processors. And E1 poles could shut them down instantly, which is why microwave weapons are being pushed so hard. So if an HEMP hits us, systems might become unflyable, undrivable, or unable to communicate. Repairs could take days or weeks, assuming diagnostics and spares are even available. Some assets, they just may be rendered useless without pre-positioned backups. Our infrastructure, like electricity and the internet, could come to a screeching halt. But who could actually do this? Really, anybody with nukes could set them off in the atmosphere and shower us with the MP. Russia tests survivability in nuclear simulators and has hardened many of its systems, but even then, they likely only use EMP in the context of a full-scale nuclear war. China is believed to have the capability, but its doctrine is unclear. And then you have North Korea, which claimed to have an EMP-optimized nuclear device back in 2017, which they showed off with a mock warhead labeled EMP but it's North Korea, so who knows. Outside of the nuclear option though, there are tactical weapons like the US Champ that we mentioned before. China and Russia may have similar systems, but those like Champ would be used in small scale localized attacks, not global blackouts. Now we know the threat is real with some asterisks, so how well are we prepared for something like this? In 2019, the White House issued an executive order requiring federal agencies to harden systems against EMPs. It called for risk assessments, EMP-resistant technology, and a national response strategy, but 
Bet you can't guess, follow through has been weak. GAO reports found no standardized shielding requirements for tactical systems and no budget line for EMP readiness. The budget line is the real big deal because unless it's like mentioned specifically in the budget, they don't have money for it. So when you say, hey, harden against EMPs, but don't give money to do it, there's not a whole lot you can do, especially in the red tape bureaucracy of Defense Department procurement and budget. It's a mess. Many critical bases and supply nodes remain very vulnerable. DHS issued best practices in 2022 that included guidance on shielding, surge protection, and testing, but they aren't mandatory. Most of the systems that are hardened are legacy Cold War strategic platforms, not the drones, radios, tactical vehicles, and supply chain systems like even barcode scanners that today's warfighters rely on. So now let's get down to this fear and maybe red team it a little bit. Could an EMP knock out satellites or disrupt battlefield communications? Absolutely. Could it cause a military collapse though? Not likely. Most strategic systems like we talked about are hardened and most tactical systems are vulnerable, but they're recoverable. And using an HEMP weapon is basically waving a massive, I want a nuclear retaliation flag and not many countries are keen to do that. The risk of escalation is so high that it's unlikely even North Korea with all their crazy would actually use it unless everything was already going to hell. And at that point, why are we worried about EMPs? Nuclear war is coming, it won't matter anyways. Ironically though, the more likely risk might come from the sun. A solar flare could do global damage like it has before and we'd have no one to retaliate against except for the sun, which we will certainly nuke. After all the damage the sun has done to me and my fellow melanin deficient individuals, it kind of deserves it. So yes, commenter guy, EMPs are real, they can be dangerous, but they're not this miracle trump card that many think they are. The military knows about EMPs, it's been preparing for them imperfectly for decades, and the bigger issue isn't even EMPs themselves, it's how much our infrastructure, civilian and military, depends on fragile, unprotected digital systems. And not to mention, but we're going to mention it, EMPs are usually the byproduct of a f nuke and that's the real problem. I wrote the script and Savvy, as always, edited the video. I wanted to thank all of you once again and always for being here, participating with us, commenting, liking, giving your feedback, your recommendations, anything you got, we are very thankful for it, so thank you. And I also wanted to thank Odoo for sponsoring this episode, and I'm also gonna push our merch store again. Here's our uh, certified barracks lawyer shirt, which I'm pretty fond of because we all know a certified barracks lawyer who's going to get you NJP'd, so don't listen to him. Anyways, these are like 25 bucks on store.taskandpurpose.com, so, Go ahead, check it out there if you want. If you're watching at this point and you want one of these, go ahead and use code ACTUALLYWATCH to get 10% off just for sticking around and listening to me run my damn mouth for way too long. So with that being said, I will now leave. I am Kyle, your friendly ginger producer man. You are all dismissed and I will see you next time.